Hello, today is Tuesday, September 24th, and we're going over government and security, like the Raiders at Area 51, <laughs> who didn't really raid anything, I guess. You know, I didn't even, there's a story about them, but it's not about the raid itself, because I don't think anything happened, right? No. Yeah, well, I don't think so. Some guy got arrested for peeing on the fence, but that was about it. <laughs> Did you never watch uh, Ren and Stimpy? <laughs> Don't whiz on the electric fence. Uh. Yeah. So, yeah, unfortunate. But definitely, I wonder, here's what I wonder about that. Because the, I'm sure some people made some money there, right? Like food trucks and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Will people be trying to create... A copy, yearly event? More, not, not even there. Just like, hmm, where's a place that we're not supposed to go? Let's create an event to go there. And we'll take the food truck there. I bet that'll happen yearly now, because like there's an opportunity to make money and sell cheap merchandise. See you guys at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. There's gonna be food trucks, which <laughs> is actually a treacherous. How are you gonna get a food truck? Down there? <laughs> it's a, also, it's, it's a it's, food donkey. I don't think you're not allowed to go there. Yeah, no, you're not. Yeah, because it would. It's like so. It would be so easy to spoil the ecosystem down there because it's. Oh, you're really not supposed to go down there? No, no. I think you can. Yeah, yeah I'm pretty can, sure you can take a trail down there. You can. You it's can, very rough, but like you, you can, can take, take a burrow and there's like a park spot, but there's places you're not supposed to go because there's like caves and places where you might die or disappear or just crazy stuff. Yeah, like but there's a trail that goes around the yeah, canyon. Yeah, but that's not like... And like actually it goes down I, in the canyon. Chat. There's a road around Area 51. I, I, we need to fact check this. I don't believe that at all. I'm, <laughs> I'm almost 90% sure because... One of the hikers I watch on YouTube did a, did there, a hike through it. There is a trail you can go on, but there's places you're not supposed to go. Well, it's true of any state park. Mm. <laughs> you're not supposed to go in the caves at Natural Bridge, but mm. that doesn't mean teenagers don't do it. They disappear. Well, let's talk yeah. about the FBI. We know that the FBI will scoop up your Google location data and your Alexa data. and Going places they're not supposed to go. Your credit card data and your car GPS data. Actually, well, there's nothing they won't scoop up, right? But the scope is even larger than we ever imagined. Secret FBI subpoenas scoop up personal data from scores of companies. And so this is in the New York Times. You know, uh, I think we've talked about this kind of thing before, how uh, the FBI is looking for really broad definitions of, like, business records, which includes, like, personal emails. And things like, oh, you've left your email on the cloud service for more than 30 days. So that's abandoned, and we have access to that as well. This is those security letters that they're so fond of. That they were given the, it was the Patriot Act and then the Freedom Act or whatever. You know, they kept renaming it. It's the same thing. It gave them the power to grab all this information. Now, the reason we know this is because eventually they have to reveal this number under a Freedom of Information style deal. What they don't have to do is reveal the individual letters because the letters can be sort of uh, reviewed from time to time and some of them they keep reviewing and they're like you know what this will be secret forever <laughs> i have a problem with the uh the investigations here because like secrecy forever is the problem like i don't have a problem with the fbi being able to go to microsoft and be like hey we want this guy's info i don't have a problem with that guy not necessarily being aware that he's the target of an investigation. But there has to be a sunset date on this. Like at some point, Google or Microsoft or whoever needs to be like, by the way, we gave so-and-so a copy of all of your crap last year or six months ago or whatever. And the fact that this is all secret, that's the problem. You know what the FBI doesn't care about? That. You having a problem. Yeah. Yeah, just any of us really. Why does it have to be secret? Like, if we're doing all this legally, why does it matter that it's secret forever? Because we just made up the law, like, <laughs> 20 years ago, and if people found out exactly what that law said, then they might be a little upset about it. Yeah. Another thing they might be a little upset about is the FBI's stance on encryption. Now, we know that the FBI is anti-encryption because the head of the FBI keeps saying, we have to get rid of encryption. It's bad. We need to destroy it. But what's more interesting is what they do when there is encryption, which is not respected. <laughs> the FBI tried to plant a backdoor in an encrypted phone network. And the, the, the motherboard subheadline is the FBI wanted a backdoor in the Phantom Secure, an encrypted phone company that sold its members to like the Sinaloa, Sinaloa, yep, Sinaloa. Uh, cartel and linked to the alleged trafficking sensitive law enforcement information. This is not the first time we covered this story. The guy that ran this phone company was actually arrested when we reported on that. And uh, he, they got a conviction. Like, the feds got a conviction against this guy. And it's because... He the, pled guilty. Well, uh, 
Yeah, he pled guilty, I guess. But the reason he pled guilty was because the Royal Canadian Mounted Police set him up and was like, hey, we're going to do criminal stuff. And he's like, okay, whatever, I don't care. And because of that, he was complicit in criminal activity. Yeah, Uh, probably he was definitely marketing to drug lords on the grounds that, hey, you're a drug lord, you need this. Because his surface, would they'd take phones, they'd pull out the GPS, they'd even pull out the microphone. Like, you didn't ever talk on these phones. You just use them for encrypted uh, data communication. And that was his market. And they paid a lot of money for that because they're drug lords and they have a lot of money. But the problem isn't that this guy was doing something wrong and they caught him. The problem was the way they wanted to go about it, which was to secretly, there's that word again, (laughs) insert a back door into these phones. And uh, he would have gotten a plea deal if he did that. But he didn't do that. And so he's going to jail for like seven years. You wonder if he figured that he did do the plea deal, that he would just be a, a cartel mark forever. Yeah, at that point, it's like, which one is the worst evil to be Uh, targeted by? Yeah, I mean, the thing about the cartel is you're not necessarily the mark. It's your family. Yeah. So, you don't want to make them mad. And speaking, oh, oh, oh. Oh, look what you've done. (laughs) He's activated the search. (laughs) It's level one new season one all over again. I'm trying to use the the story splitter thing. (laughs) It's, It's working against me. Uh, Speaking of uh, cartels, I guess is one way of putting it. Uh, The FBI... (laughs) Okay, so the FBI is this overreaching shadow and they're in all parts of our lives and they have all this technology and power. But sometimes they run into a group that's been doing that for a lot longer than they have (laughs) and is better at it. Uh, Russia carried out a stunning, in quotation marks, breach of FBI communication systems, escalating to spy and spy game to the U.S. soil. So this is talking about the embassies. Remember, we had like the Russian embassy exposure, and it was like, oh, it's because of election interference. This article, if you don't like, you got to read this. It's long, and it's got a lot of details. It's not really about the election thing. It's about a lot of stuff. But there's also some dumb stuff in here, like the stunning breach of FBI communication systems. Turns out they were using walkie-talkies that were known to be not the most secure. Yeah, and so the FBI was spying on the Russians, right? So they had their their FBI surveillance van, uh, <laughs> Wi-Fi ID outside there. They really did have FBI surveillance vans and these dragnets, and they were watching these guys. But the Russians were aware of every bit of it and they had countermeasures and they were in turn observing the FBI observing them (laughs) and working circles around them (laughs) so it turns out back during the Obama days we uh, expelled some diplomats that's why it wasn't the election meddling it was this (laughs) and there's so much detail here there's so much just uh... but yeah our people shouldn't be using technology so terrible and the article did actually try to figure that out, and it was mostly just bureaucratic. They played themselves. Yeah. They own gold. It. Is that what you say? I don't know. It's a sports metaphor. So, <laughs> No, that's, that's played yourself is not a sports metaphor. Oh, okay. It's not. No, it's a meme. Oh. Congratulations. You played yourself. Yeah. You've seen that meme? No. Oh. It's all over Twitter. Maybe. You're on Twitter all the time. Maybe I, maybe I, I don't it's know. It's on a different part of Twitter. I, I've, probably, <laughs> I've probably seen it, but not understood it. Well, Krista, you alluded to this. The, I did. The big Area 51 event happened. It came and went. Nothing really happened. But there was that threat. And the powers that be got a little nervous, I think, at one point. Because they saw that 2 million number and they were like, uh, what if the proles really do get out of line? What are we going to do? And I think they want to take some steps to prevent that. Authorities consider taking legal action against Facebook over the Storm Area 51 event. Not just Facebook, but also one of the guys who ran the groups. And he was just sort of doing it as a lark, I guess. I well, don't know. But, like, the real question is, like, what? who cares about Facebook here? Wouldn't you want to go after the person who actually organized it? Well, no, I think the... Or are they just looking for another fee, like a fine? No, they're looking at, like I said, I think they're looking at copycats, right? Because now you figured out that, hey... If I want to create a big, I mean, think about it, if that guy just harvested emails from his Facebook <laughs> group. It's two million emails. Yeah, that's valuable. So if people are repeating this, or people try to use this to go viral or whatever, then they want to make sure that Facebook is dealing with it, and they don't have to. So, 
Plus, the, you know, just fine Facebook, right? That's the thing that's, you do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it seems like it's just another excuse for a fine. How cool would it have been if the uh, the army had done something hilarious? Like, you remember the thing from uh, Close Encounter? No, it's not Close Encounter. Was it Close Encounters, maybe? Where, like, the ship landed and they were, like, playing the music with the thing and the lights. Yeah, that was Close Encounters. They should have rigged up something at Area 51 and just, like, flown it out over the crowd and then just played that. That would be funny. Just something to mess with them. Or they could have just disappeared them for a couple of days. <laughs> put something up their ass well, and, you know, leave them in the desert. Something to mess with them and then cause, like, a diplomatic incident when all the other countries were like, wait, what is that? <laughs> it's fine. Well, actually, we're going to talk about some of that yeah. in the nonsense uh, section. Yeah, actually, that's, that's a big story. That was a way bigger story. If you're really conspiracy-minded, <laughs> you might think that the Area 51 thing was going to cover up that little nugget that they released. But we won't talk about that right now. Instead, this is a little bit of a non-story uh, the, the headline that I clicked through is actually better than the actual headline and made me think there was more to it. Really, all this story says is that the FCC is garbage. <laughs> yeah, so it's in Forbes, and the headline is Robocalls Keep Pouring In As Hijacking Threat Emerges and How to Stop. How to Stop, I'll spoil it for you. You set your phone to do not disturb all the time except for people on your contact list. And you watching this show, you should have already known that. But they do admit that spoofing, they call it hijacking, which, like... I thought it was spoofing. It's spoofing. Can we agree on a term, Forbes? <laughs> they admitted that that's up like 50% and that only 12% of the scam calls come from non-spoofed numbers. Yeah. So this could still get through this bulletproof solution that they give you here. Yeah. I mean, it's less likely because the odds of your contact being on it. I guess it depends on how many friends you have in your town. In or your if phone. they're using like other business numbers. So, yeah, good job, a Jeep pie. We don't have an a Jeep pie story this week, so we'll have to just yeah. Throw that's one like the bus your uh, suboxin for a Jeep pie this week. Oh, the story is in this. I didn't know it was in this. Of course, there it, it is. It would be government, right? Oh yeah, I thought it was in nonsense, but okay. So yeah, what as we had the Area Fifty One deal, this story came out. Which now we talked about this originally. But when we talked about it originally, it was still like, mm, is this real? I mean, it seems very real, and these pilots are talking, but what the government isn't saying anything about it. Could it be just a misunderstanding? Well, we have our answer. The Navy confirms the existence of an unidentified flying object seen in leaked footage. So there's three movie clips. This thing does not, it, can't, it moves uh, unlike any piloted aircraft could because a pilot would not survive the G-forces. Maybe that's the technology. X-Files theme's playing in my head right now. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, the guy from Blink-182, of all people, is on top of the UFO world, and he put these videos up. And apparently these pilots have confirmed every bit of this, and they said it was never explained, and it was terrifying. And it's... The, the reality has to be either the equi equipment was malfunctioning and the pilots were... It was some sort of visual hallucination or something. Or aliens. Or magical technology that's so light years beyond anything that we've seen that, like, the next war just won't even be a war. <laughs> We're just not going to be here in one day. <laughs> yeah, just gone. That's uh, a disturbing thought. <laughs> I mean, if a if an aircraft could move like that and accelerate like that, you could, you could do, like, a relativistic kill from inside <laughs> orbit yeah yeah the uh, uh you know at first i thought it was a drone or something but then even if it is as yeah. fast as it was moving and yeah. as maneuverable as it was holy smokes you think that's going to get through a missile defense system no no, no i think it will yeah what are you talking about it won't oh no no i thought oh i thought you meant will it be stopped by a missile defense no system? no it, no, would, yeah, yeah, it yeah. would penetrate yeah and you know just put a warhead on it yeah so <laughs> Game over. I hope Russia's not the one that has that technology. That would be bad. I mean, all this money we're spending on hypersonic missiles. Yeah, I mean, if somebody's already got that. I mean, I, I'm thinking back to like the 80s when people were seeing the uh, like the stealth bomber and like reporting that because it was classified at the time. And like this doesn't have anything on that. Yeah, the leap in technology yeah. is more like Stone Age to today. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's we would I mean, have we mastered the gravitational force? Can we produce gravity artificially? Because that's really exciting. If, it was, is. if if that's the case, then like imagine if that came out and on the, all the wars in the Middle East 
Like just doesn't the, our our entire lifetime would be one big war crime. Yeah. yeah. So I could see the reason to hide that. <laughs> We need to go to the asteroids and get raw materials, and then it's fine. Or the moon. Hey, the Japanese are working on it. Edward Snowden. Edward <laughs> Snowden is a polarizing figure. Some there's, people. There's a name we haven't heard in a while. Yeah. Some people think he's, he's uh, treacherous, and some people think he's a hero. He has written a book, <laughs> but there are rules about making money off of a crime. And so the powers that be have said, we want that money. <laughs> yeah, here's a copy of the lawsuit, and that's there's really not much else to report here other than they're like we want we want the money from the book, and the, I've only read the first eight chapters, but it's literally just this is my life experience as a child, and that's yeah, it. Yeah, well, every time somebody writes a, a tell-all book, they find it necessary to tell all <laughs> to tell the boring, just ridiculously uninteresting parts of their life. And it's like, oh, no one cares. <laughs> the part, Chapter one, when I started working for the NSA. <laughs> but uh, Start where the action starts. Yeah, exactly. They do bring up that uh, he did sign a contract when he went to work for the NSA. And I think he had a, a similar contract with the CIA when mm -hmm. he did work for them. And he did agree that he would never do this. So it's yeah. not really... Are we violating his rights? I mean, it's a contract. <laughs> How very capitalistic of you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah listen. Uh, yeah. Read it. <laughs> Don't work for the... Hey, if you're a contractor on the Death Star and they turn around and screw you, who's the idiot? <laughs> Amazon. Amazon has the Alexa and everybody loves it because Alexa can do all these wonderful things, including a report to the FBI. <laughs> And if you want even more interaction with your government, Alexa, uh, Alexa can now do that as well. Amazon will soon let you make campaign contributions through your Alexa device. This is truly the darkest timeline. Alexa, donate. That's, <laughs> that's literally what you do. <laughs> yeah. So uh, they talk about, I mean, there's really not much else to it. That, now they do point out here that it's principal candidates, but they, point out, they update the story later to say that if the Federal Election Committee considers that candidate a candidate, they can go on the Amazon list. I think there's already 12 people on that list, so. Yeah. Well, that's just the Democrats, right? Yeah. So, uh, the other cool thing about it, well, I, mean, I don't know about uh, cool thing about it, but. Interesting. Interesting. Technological thing about it is it will actually give you up to 12 nicknames. So, for example, Beta O'Rourke, that's not his name. But Amazon will accept that. Bernard Sanders will accept Bernie. So, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> Alexa, give Bernie $5. Yeah, <laughs> it'll do it. Can you train the Alexa to play a flushing sound whenever you give money to any candidate? You think there are Amazon resellers scrambling to create Change businesses their, yeah. with the name of all the presidential <laughs> candidates? Uh, <laughs> truly the darkest timeline. Okay. Gabby's surplus aluminum. It's <laughs> basically. I'm just I'm I'm imagining like the political commercials. Like imagine somebody watching a TV, a TV ad. You just know, say Alexa. Yeah, it's like to you know like this person has done this horrible thing and they eat babies. All you need to do to help us is to just tell your digital assistant to give us money. It's just wh what? Mm. And then. Your smart TV logs the fact that you watched that commercial, and your Alexa logs the fact that you contributed <laughs> to a candidate. All of that goes to the FBI. <laughs> the smart TV is reporting to China. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> we talked about uh, California and they're spearheading the privacy initiative. They have the strictest laws when it comes to stopping things like uh, data collecting and facial recognition and putting cameras everywhere and stuff like that. Some cities have even banned cameras. Which is, or well, at least facial recognition cameras, not not cameras in general. But there is a powerful, powerful lobby working on the opposite end of that, and this is not exactly the revolving door. How would you? What would be the analogy here? Oh, there's some kind the, of a joke here. The adjoining suite. <laughs> Uh, the spouse of ring exec among lawmakers trying to weaken California privacy law. So this is the same group of companies that have called for a federal privacy, data privacy law for individuals, 
But here we have the spouse of, uh, you know, a ring executive among the lawmakers trying to weaken it. Wouldn't, forgive my ignorance, but wouldn't that be like a conflict of interest? And isn't there some sort uh, of like <laughs> pre-existing way that they deal with that? No, you think? Like, well, so obviously that was brought up to her and her response was, how dare you? <laughs> I'm doing this because I believe in it, not because of anything that my husband does for a living. Well, that being said, you are married to someone who would profit off of this, so we're just going to exclude you from this vote. Krista, you are being uh, just ridiculous here. <laughs> this is a woman who's serving her community. That may be, but not in this case. So she's fighting against uh, very specific parts of it, which, uh, like the opt-in part, which would mean that You'd have to opt in to having your facial recognition data on a ring, which means that if I came to your house and that data went in, how would you ever get me to opt in? Oh, yeah. Be impossible. So she's saying like, oh, that's ridiculous. Let's not do that. <laughs> well, by the same token, if you uh, if it's not opt in and it's opt out, how would you know to opt out if you went to somebody else's house? Excellent question. Uh-huh. All the more reason that we shouldn't have that, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, how about we just don't do that? Ah, France. France now, whereas California is at the forefront in America, France is kind of at the forefront in Europe, although it's not so much the forefront of protecting your privacy. That's the stated goal, I guess. But it's really at the forefront of extracting fines from tech companies. They are amazing at it. And you know a big, juicy tech company that has a ton of money? Steam. Ooh. <laughs> a French court has ruled that Steam's ban on reselling used games is contrary to European law. The whole thing hinges on a technicality. The technicality was that Steam is not a subscription service. So, why doesn't Steam just start charging one cent per year? To French people? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that would be an excellent workaround. Yeah. But I've also, I, this story didn't mention it, but I saw one story that said that the fine could be 3,000 euro per day for six months. Wow. That seems like a lot for this. No, but it, uh, Gaben wipes his ass with that amount of money. <laughs> That's it, like CSGO skins for a day. <laughs> what? Eh. They could easily pay that. Maybe that's the point then. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, this will have a, a side effect for like indie games and stuff. I mean, what do you think? Does it... I don't know if this helps or hurts smaller game publishers. Well, it would certainly hurt them more than it would hurt Valve because Valve is still going to take their percentage off of a marketplace transaction. Yeah. Valve probably probably doesn't care monetarily about it, just the headache. Well, I mean. well they get like 10% of that versus 30% of the full price. They care. Gaiman has in- intimated in the past that sometimes some of the deals with the individual game companies, like the medium size and the larger companies, like the CD, CD Projekt Red, like where they have the, the game in perpetuity, that Valve absorbs some of those costs for storage and handling and crap like that. Where do you think this leaves the Epic Game Store? Do they operate in France? Probably. Yeah, I mean, uh, this would affect all the other game companies as well, unless there's some kind of subscription service. It wouldn't affect WoW, ironically. Well, GOG, I mean, technically, that's DRM free, so you could sell that. I guess. Yeah. You could give it away, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Be interesting to see where this one goes. I think they could just say, okay, we'll pay it. And you know what? French prices just went up 10%. Because <laughs> we know they charge more. Like in Australia, they charge more for games, right? Yeah. So they can do that. Just screw the French people. Why not? Switzerland. Switzerland, I have a lot of respect for because they are smack in the middle of that horrible continent. And they say, bro, take your trade organization and your little uh, bullshit union and you just pack it on out of here. We don't need it. (laughs) They own all the banks, though, so I mean. And uh, they also have that same kind of mentality when it comes to the copyright laws. Swiss copyright law. Downloading stays legal. No site blocking. So copyright holders were looking to have Swiss ISPs block a bunch of pirate sites, but uh, downloading is, or uploading is still illegal, but downloading is not illegal. But it doesn't really clarify how like peer-to-peer services work where you are both downloading and uploading. That's probably still an offense, but just downloading content is not an offense. But you get the impression that they're not gonna, you know, like kick down your door like a lot of countries will. Yeah. 
just based on this. You know, we're not going to have any kind of like Jamie Thomas style rulings here where, you know, five MP3s leads to a million dollars or whatever. Yeah. So <laughs> obviously the, the MPAA and all those organizations furious, furious about this because a lot of, was the Pirate Bay in Switzerland originally? No, I think it, it sound I, right? I think it's Sweden. Hmm. Well, a lot of pirate sites have gone to Switzerland because of this. Oh, it's yeah. one of the few places where, you know, you can still kind of go. And the, and they've ruled that you don't have to take those sites down. Yeah. So, Well, they have ruled that if the site is hosted in Switzerland, that that is not legal. So they still will have some legal tools to take those sites down. But for people that are downloading content within Switzerland, not a problem. It's more, sort of weird. In the geopolitical realm... Australia and China have kind of become BFFs lately because China is supplying a lot of raw materials and output from their manufacturing juggernaut to Australia and making a lot of money, kind of like they did for us yeah. for the longest time. You know, <laughs> Australia also gives them a lot of raw materials. Yeah, so nice, right? But what happens when you find out that the other side of this really, really lucrative deal has been watching you. Uh, Reuters has a... It's a pretty interesting article. Exclusive. Australia concluded China was behind the hack on parliament and political parties. So, yeah. Australia figured it out. And uh, the delegation from the U.S. went there and like tried to make it into a big deal. Like They were like, what? No, we're going to protect the citizens. Are you, you going to take that, Australia? Yeah, I mean, that's that's what it was, basically. And Australia was like, uh, we're hacking them, <laughs> they're hacking us. Yeah. I mean, you we know kind of need their stuff, though. We really like these guys. Kind of reminds you of that time that uh, Israel was hacking Washington, D.C. <laughs> I also like the... Uh, I mean, th that's really how the article felt. was like, you know, one, everybody's hacking everybody else. And two, uh, maybe China's just insecure. They want to know what we really think. Like, are they nice to our face and then they're like backstabby? Or are they, do they really like us? Really, global politics is just teenage girls. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Uh, that's, With nukes. Uh, teenage girls who <laughs> will get the rest of the school killed <laughs> as part of their little game. Which, I guess, if, they had, the, boys, right? if they had the ability to do that, they would. <laughs> Uh, well, India. India, I think, you know, they've been sitting back. They're this emerging market. They're coming into their own in terms of, you know, having a huge middle class and all this power with, uh, with buying power and the global market. And they're saying to themselves, you know what? I think it's time for us to get in this game of finding big tech companies. And this might be the opening salvo toward that. India is telling tech firms to protect user privacy and prevent abuse. And as you read this article... The, it basically says we have no idea how to tell you what to do to actually do this. We just expect you to do this. Meanwhile, India has had some of the most egregious missteps in terms of user data security because they had the the, uh, the, biometrics. The, the the biometric database. What was the one? There was one like the biometrics database was used for cows and then it was adapted to people or something. something no, crazy. people were registering their pets and their oh, cows yeah. to get the the benefits. Yeah. yeah. Uh. It's crazy. Now, you, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I ordered these stories in a certain way on purpose. <laughs> because on one hand, we have Indus, India saying privacy. Privacy is paramount. You must protect it because in India, privacy matters. Then on the other hand, <laughs> we have this. India is planning a huge China-style facial recognition program. Now, these, these to me don't seem to be at odds. It's like, we're going to build this massive invasive database and we must protect it. Because we're going to build a massive invasive database, regardless of our ability to protect it. But we have to think back about that biometric database that you mentioned, which was hacked in, what, like three months? Yeah, not even that? Not even. And so. that's not the first time. There were actually three or four hacks like that. The voter registration data was also hacked. Mm -hmm. And, like, some mobile phone network was hacked. So you get all your mobile phones and subscriber info and address. And, that's and they figured out that they secured one version of the software but if you just downgraded to a previous version and wouldn't let it update you could register as many new people into the system as you wanted to yeah that's the cows and dogs so hey if you can get a federal tax benefit from registering your dog okay whatever he's a, he contributes to the household a security specialist <laughs> <laughs> we're just really good at begging for food 
How's, how's Rue's tail doing? She's doing really good. She should have her stitches out by Wednesday. Hmm. And then she'll be able to take the cone off. What body part do you think she'll lose next? Hopefully none. Because <laughs> there's a new dog park opening and I want her to go. Maybe she'll be ready for her big her big debut with her shorter tail. You think she'll be embarrassed about it? You know, like self-conscious? You know, or? I don't know if Rue has that any kind of <laughs> capability like that. She seems happy all the time, so... <laughs> Well, what about, you know, Rue is, uh, I guess she's kind of like into her teenage years, right? Yes, early 20s, according to the chart on the vet's office. So she is right in that pocket of people who are being heavily influenced toward vaping. How how worried are you about that? You know, I have caught her taking a couple puffs of my husband's, and I'm like, Rue, <laughs> we've talked about this, and Rue says, oof. Her little growing lungs. Yeah. Well, it's a good thing she's not in India, because India, alongside their new database and their privacy rules, have taken a stance on vaping. India, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I didn't know which one of us was going to read it. India bans e-cigarettes as global vaping backlash grows. The vape niche grows bigger every day. <laughs> but not if India can stop it. Well, the ban is following vape-related deaths. so Which are at, what, well, I think we might be up to 400 now? Yeah. Compared to tobacco. Mm. Is that confirmed? Mm. 400? Yeah, I think, well, they, what they figured out is that, so... You can't. You can diffuse nicotine yes. in water. You can't diffuse THC in water. So you have to have some, some kind of oil-based deal. And the oil is what causes the issue. It's not even the oil. It's like the oil was never meant for that. It was meant for something else, and it has additives like I think vitamin E, maybe. Uh-huh. <laughs> and vitamin E is not supposed to go in your lungs or whatever it is. It's something benign, except until you put it in your lungs. That's so, true of a lot of things that are quote unquote natural. It's like, yes, that's fine to like, you know, eat, but you don't really want to rub it all over your skin. But it, it's, it doesn't really condemn example. vaping per se. Here's what I think. I think everybody is getting on the ban vaping bandwagon and eventually they're going to be like, okay, we have to regulate this. And because we have to regulate it, everything has to go through the FDA. And because everything has to go through the FDA, there's a 50% tax. <laughs> Probably. Mark my words on that one. And Philip Morris is already ahead of the game by buying Jewel. I think <laughs> Philip Morris is like got to be behind some of this, right? Yeah. It's a it's a crazy. They story. must control the market. I love triggering the vapors, but I have to admit this is it's crazy. It's the, a little bit bullshit. The mania that we're getting. In. Oh, actually, we know the number. Here's the number because I added ah. this story too. It's five hundred and thirty. Vaping criminal probe announced by the FDA as illnesses rise to 530. Don't worry. This story confirms that these are illicit vaping products and illegal vaping products, not actual sanctioned from vaping company vaping products that are causing the deaths. Mostly. So there's really, yeah, there's not much to that story. It's just that we've, we've found another thing to be crazy about, and it's vaping. It's going to kill you. Only if you start vaping battery acid and household Mixing your own, cleaners yeah. and solvents and whatever. I wonder how much of that is like blogs where it's like, I mix my own organic, natural yeah. <laughs> vape juice. I didn't think that's, about that. Well, like, there's probably a little bit of that. But I think, Not all uh, of it, but probably some. I think you, the, like the starter fluid for vape juice is just that vegetable glycol, glycol stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. So... You just put flavor in there, right? I think that even that would be pretty safe. It's it's when you try to get the THC to diffuse into something. It's got to be. Uh-oh. It's time for the leak slash breach of the week. We're going to consolidate the two because it's all really the same thing, right? Either somebody gets in or somebody leaves something without a password. And it's the same thing. It's your data. It's out there. There's nothing you can do about it. Just, just remind you. Millions of Americans' medical images and data are available on the internet. And scroll down, there's, there's an x-ray there. A lot of x-rays. So, the question that I have is, why do the x-ray machines need to be in the cloud? I guess if you're... Um, Consulting other doctors? That's what I was going to say. Yeah, that's the only thing. It's Training like, the AI? Listen, doctors are so busy, they cannot be bothered to send patient A's medical records to Dr. B. They do well, have medical... Or not medical, but like... 
staff who are supposed to do that kind of thing, but maybe they're busy too. When you use the x-ray machine, it automatically posts to a GeoCities page, and all you got to do is type in your name, and you can the other doctor can search it. What I kind of got that impression because they said that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they didn't say exactly how to do it, but they said if you had just like the most basic knowledge yeah. of how websites work. I get the idea that you were just filling in some URL parameters yeah. to find whoever. Yeah. I like to imagine when that story was posted, like someone ro- saw that in their news feed and was reading it. And they like scrolled down and they're looking at the pictures and like, is that my job? <laughs> <laughs> well, they said if you've had one recently, you should call the hospital and ask them how they're doing all this. Of course, the people you talk to on the phone at the hospital aren't going to know. No. Yeah. So. yeah. And they're trained to be like, no, all of our stuff is really secure. And it probably is up until the point that the x-ray technician is like, nope, just upload all. Don't care. Don't want to think about it. Don't want to think about this. Just upload, upload, upload. Or that's how they were trained. I mean, they're not really technical people yeah. in, but in that sort of sense. You know what I mean? If you had some kind of really unique, like, you know, one of those metal plates or, you know, screws or whatever, you might be able to find your own x-ray in there. Yeah. That'd be interesting. But... At least it's not as bad as Ecuador. <laughs> because in Ecuador, they had one hell of a leak. Ooh, the database leak on most of Ecuador's citizens, including 6.7 million children. The Elasticsearch server leaks personal data on Ecuador's citizens, their family trees, children, and also some users' financial records and car registration information. Here's a uh, security pro tip for you. Elasticsearch shouldn't be on the internet. It should be listing on, like, local host or something. More importantly, you might be thinking... What agency would have all that information together? Well, it turns out a marketing agency. (laughs) They were building universal profiles, and that's the kind of information they have on you. A marketing agency in charge of data security? That's that's bad news. So it's all out there. There were more records than there are people in Ecuador, but with duplicates, I don't think necessarily everybody was affected, but just almost everybody. (laughs) The only people that weren't affected were... People that can't afford to buy anything. <laughs> well, well, uh, you're so poor that you can afford pi- privacy. That's crazy. You can have prosperity or privacy, not both. <laughs> we have not seen a lot of stories about big botnets in the past couple of weeks, but that doesn't mean that they're not around. This one came before, and now it's back, but because of its previous activities... It has more ammunition. World's most destructive botnet returns with stolen passwords and email now. They are, it's the, the new botnet is putting together convincing emails from people that you've corresponded with in the past using pieces of emails that you've corresponded with in the past. I got an example here. And there's malicious attachments. And the malicious attachments are amazing because when you open the document, it's like sign into your Office 365 or enable macros to see this document. And so if you do that, it's bad news bears. I think we so. had a client have something like this oh, yeah. a while back. Oh, yeah. And I well, had to explain to her, like, do not. Do not open If this. you get an email from her that says, per my last email, yeah, don't open that Word document. Yeah. So it, it's pretty impressive in terms of malware email technology, that they're able to extract pieces of old emails to try to make it look convincing. Now, I probably, if you read closely, it, it probably is disjointed and crazy. But then again... Some of the clients that we have, disjointed crazy emails are standard issue. For, uh, you know, first DeepMind solved, you know, Go. And now DeepMind is the most efficient AI to deploy malware. Yeah, you, once the genie's out of the bottle, you can't really stop it. If you've paid the government recently, wow, that was unpleasant, wasn't it? <laughs> but it might have been more unpleasant than you can imagine. <laughs> They're doing what with my tax dollars? Payment card thieves hack Click2Gov bill paying portals in eight cities. New wave of attacks comes after previous Click2Gov hack compromised 300,000 payment cards. So it turns out payment card stuff secured by the lowest bidder, probably not a good idea. (laughs) Click to steal. (laughs) That might be the headline for for this. uh, (laughs) This segment. If you are using a password manager to try and manage all of those passwords on your sites that you're changing regularly, right? Because they keep getting hacked and you're not using the same one on every site, right? Because <laughs> if it goes to the dark web, then they can get into anywhere that's using your email address. Well, you pretty much have to use software, but you still might be screwed. 
LastPass bug leaks credentials from the previous site. LastPass has released a fix last week. Vulnerability details are now public. Basically, like when you get ready to use a password on LastPass and you set the thing, if you go to another site that you use the password with, that site could steal the previous site's password. Which doesn't really seem like a huge deal, but it is, I mean, it's potentially bad. It's very specific. Yeah. You did, Well, if you had a, a, legi- a, a legitimate site that redirected you after you set a password, maybe. Well, no, but then you'd be getting that password. Yeah. Now, you'd, you'd, now it'd have to be more complex than that. Yeah. I mean, it's one of these things that a security researcher came up with, and what are the odds? But again, if you have... For example, the Chinese government behind this with a think tank, (laughs) they might figure out a way to use it. (laughs) The FBI has convinced, you know, Gmail to like, it's like, we need to steal their, their password from this. And it's like, all right, we'll add that to Gmail. You'd never know. RDP. It's super convenient. It's amazing. Imagine back in the day when we said to ourselves, gosh, I wish I could use that computer, but I'm not there. And Microsoft figured it out (laughs) and it's great, but it gets hacked. A lot of people want that because, hey, it's unfettered access to a computer. And we really didn't know how often it was happening other than empirical results. But because of some updates that have been made to software, we now have some solid numbers. And they're terrifying. Exposed RDP servers. So if you're running Windows and you've got a remote desktop turned on, you're going to see 150,000 brute force attempts per week. And so you're going to want to turn that off. You're going to want to use a VPN. Even running RDP on a non-standard port. Once the bots discover that RDP is running on the non-standard port, you're going to get exponentially more attacks every week. And eventually, even if you've got a really complicated password, they're going to get in. And if they get into that... Yeah, it's over. Yeah. Just just set it on fire. That's all you can do. <laughs> and if your computer is part of a network with lots of other computers, it's bad news for those computers as well. It's bad news all around. Open source is an interesting world because software gets shared and it's collaborative, but then you get weird things like people wanting to control your language on open <laughs> source. And so it's like, well, once something is out there, who owns it? Is it okay to take it back? Interesting questions. In this case, one person did that very thing. It was maybe a Pyrrhic victory, but he felt better. (laughs) Developer takes down Ruby library after he finds out ICE, that's Immigrations and Customs here in the U.S., was using it. Now, ICE here has been doing some questionable things with regard to immigrants and deportation and a lot of of really scary stuff. And uh, the article says the developer had read about those things and was like losing sleep at night and couldn't figure it out. And so ultimately he decided to just kill the library. The media would never blow those things out of proportion. No. I'm sure this was justified. It is really scary how much media is like, let's make this the most ridiculous thing ever to get the clicks because that's how we make money now. Especially, I mean, we're part of the media. Yeah, well, yeah. But especially when they, they show you those horrible pictures that are from 2012. <laughs> Yeah, Krista, what if you discovered that some of like, your, your CSS libraries were being used to like murder children somehow? I probably would have done the same thing this guy did. I'm a sap. I'd start charging money for it. I would feel bad about it for a while, but then it would be like, <laughs> I probably shouldn't. I don't care. Yeah, actually, there are some programs that are like, this is free unless you're a government agency and then you got to get a license, yeah. which is actually fine. You a can do that. A lot of places do that. Or they have like a, a commercial license. Yeah. Then you can sue them if you find out they're using it. Yeah, which is actually kind of exciting. That's a, that's actually a real problem with some of like the Node.js libraries. You can start using, it's like Node, run this thing, and then later you get a letter from a lawyer that's like, oh, this, that wasn't actually free. What? Hmm. That sounds like a problem. You know what else is a problem? Internet of Things. More and more we find out <coughs> weird things that Internet of Things is doing even when there's no reason for it to do them. And here is a perfect example of that with your smart TV. NBC News. Yeah, so the normies are getting this. Smart TVs, home, smart home devices, and uh, that kind of thing have been found to leak sensitive user data, researchers find. Nearly all TV devices in our test beds contact Netflix, even though we never configure any TV with a Netflix account, the researchers wrote. Yeah, it turns out that it's in manufacturers' commercial interest to make all of their TVs smart TVs so they can mine data and sell you ads. Also, uh, Facebook, they mentioned. Uh, There was one other one. I can't remember. But these TVs 
without you ever using those are reporting and you're thinking well they don't know who I am right I'm wrong that's your marketing profile they know exactly who you are and they're letting these companies know everything that they can figure out about you so that you can be better marketed to <laughs> the Internet of Things is not your Internet of Things it does not belong to you the Internet of Things is designed to own you you are the product they want to sell more crap to you yeah and on that note what do we got for tomorrow Tomorrow will be business, and uh, let's see if today was security. Tomorrow will probably be robot. Neat. See you tomorrow. <laughs>